G'day, my name's Sam Bailey. What a thrill to have been invited to be part of the Boarding School Expo. I had six of the most wonderful years of my life away at a boarding school. And if you're a parent out there considering or trying to make a decision whether you do send your boy or girl away to a boarding school, I can thoroughly recommend it because the benefits are just endless. Well, I have a story that I'd love to share with you all. We all have stories. Mine's a pretty simple one. I was born and raised on a family farm. Just dreamt and dreamt of spending my life on the land. And I had it all planned. But unfortunately, I found out that plans don't always go to plan. I had a little bit of bad luck a few years ago, which threatened to shatter that lifelong dream that I'd had. But I made a decision pretty early on to stand back up, pick up whatever pieces were left and, and soldier on and try and have a go at turning not much into something worthwhile. Can I just share parts of my story with you all here today in the hope that you can all take something away that might help you and maybe your life doesn't quite go the way you thought. And maybe my story also is just a gentle reminder to you all that, you know, when you really do stop and think, we are all so very, very bloody lucky to live in this great country. Right, Righto, quick bit of history. I, um, I was born and raised on a family farm, as I said, at a little place in Cropper Creek. Cropper Creek's a little village of a dozen, dozen or so people right up in northwest New South Wales. And I just remember from day one, the bush was in my blood, the dirt was under my fingernails. All I wanted to be was a farmer, just like my dad, you know, wherever he was, I was. If he put his hands on his hips from pose for a photo, well, so did I. And I don't know what it is. Is, is it a wonderful lifestyle you have growing up on a farm that certainly toughens you up? And, you know, when I remember back, I, I learned grit, you know, from a very early age. I saw mum and dad cope with fires and floods and droughts and they never gave up, they always pushed through. And, and there was a saying, and I heard it a number of times, oh, well, wiped out this year, but next year will be better. We all had animals on the farm. You know, livestock give you enormous satisfaction, but, you know, we had cattle. They, they get bogged in dams, they break legs, they have trouble carving. I saw dad had to put down numerous animals as I was growing up. We all had pets as kids. They give you hours and hours of pleasure and become like another limb of your body. But they too, they get run over, they get bitten by snakes, they die of all sorts of mysterious ways. I remember my first introduction to that was, I got up one morning to go and let my best mate Wally off the chain. And when I got there, he's dead on the chain. In all that, you know, I learned to grieve. I learned to accept. I learned to toughen up but I learned to get on with it. And little did I know that was to help me enormously fuse down the track. So was it the wonderful lifestyle? Was it the fascination of growing crops? Was it the, as I said, the love of nurturing the animals? And then of course it was all the first that came along and kept fueling that love affair. First push bike, the first horse, the first motorbike I learned to ride, the first tractor I climbed up and piloted by myself, the first wild pig that I shot, the first Billy Cartman brother and I built. It was bloody hard work pushing it, but we soon worked out that if we got a length of rope and tied one end of it to the front of the Billy Cart and the other end to the back of the motorbike, we solved that problem. You know, they were just they were great days. I had my life, as I said, all planned. I'd get through my schooling, a year or two or three out in the big wide world, and then it was back home to take the reins from dad, marry, family, that in a nutshell was how I thought it would all pan out. So I, uh, I kick-started my education at Little Cropper Creek Primary School. Six years there where I learnt my ABC in one, two, three. I was then sent away to boarding school. I went to TAS, or the Armadale School in Armadale, where I guess the grand finale there was doing my HSC in year 12, way back in 1985, where I, uh, I graduated in rugby, cricket and athletics and, and gained a higher distinction in being able to find my way over a girls' boarding school. So as you can probably imagine, when my HSC mark arrived home, we, uh, we had a quick look at it, and then it was very quickly put away in a bottom drawer of a desk somewhere. My first year out of school, I landed myself a job on a property up in Western Queensland, near a little place called Stonehenge, which is about 150 k southwest of Longreach. So up I went, my old hold new. I had a wonderful year. You know, worked hard, played hard, made some lifelong friendships, 
and just fell hopelessly in love with the outback. So the following year, I moved myself even further north to land myself a job on a big cattle station up in the Northern Territory, a place called Avon Downs, which is up on the Barclay Tablelands. So I remember I came home for Christmas at the end of, what was that, 1986, and early the following year, climbed back into my old holding ute and set sail for the Northern Territory for what I thought was going to be another wonderful year. Got up there, was nearly four months into the job and just having an absolute blast. It was a Sunday afternoon, as I remember, and there wasn't a lot going on. We'd been given the day off and so we'd had lunch and, and then yours truly thought he'd try and liven the pace up a little bit by seeing if I could talk a couple of the crew into joining me for a trip back into Camelwell for a beer. So I rallied around and I managed to talk two of them into, into joining me for the, uh, for the, for the drive into Camelwell. And there was a little bit of method in my madness because one of the two that I talked into coming with me was the governor's. Her name was Alex, she was 21, and the prettiest thing I've ever seen in my life. And I just got word through the previous week that you'd just broken up with a boyfriend who lived in Adelaide. So, while the heart's broken, move in for the kill. I thought to myself, I can't believe this, I can't believe 99% of the opposition have got no idea what's going on. I, at that stage of my life, thought I was God's gift to the female race anyway. How could I miss? So I remember we um, we assembled in afternoon. There I was, done it like a Christmas tree, covered in you know, a bottle and a half of aftershave, climbed in the back of this car, got a whiff of her perfume, which got blood flowing in all sorts of directions. I had my, all my fingers crossed this was going to be my big night. So we shut the doors, we drove out the station entrance road, turned right on the Barclay Highway, Jimmy Barnes was screaming, we were all screaming, and uh, Sam was going to arrive home madly, madly in love, and away we went. We never made it to uh, Cameron Wheel, and I discovered that your life can change pretty quickly. We got 15, 20 minutes down the road, we were flying. We had a blowout in the front passenger side tire of the car. The car rolled several times, I was a passenger in the back seat, didn't have a seatbelt on was thrown out the back window and came to lying on the side of the road. I straight away knew there was something pretty seriously wrong as I was completely paralysed and I had no sensation at all of my lower body. So much so that I remember my first words to a couple who had obviously pulled up and were kneeling down beside me. I said to them, geez, I hope I don't spend the rest of my life in a wheelchair. So I guess you could say that I was preparing myself pretty early on for what was about to become reality. I, um, Sam certainly got the diagnosis right. I um, bar from three or four little cuts on my left arm and a dislocated right hip. I broke my neck in that car accident and severed my spinal cord completely at the base of my neck, now leaving me a quadriplegic, which basically means I've got limited use of arms and hands I'm paralysed from my chest down. I've got no sensation at all from my chest down. I've now lost bowel and bladder control. I now have a total inability to be able to regulate my body temperature. And I've now only got about 45% of my lung capacity left because unfortunately I've got quite a few muscles paralysed around my lungs. So to cut a long, long story short, uh, a couple of rides um, with the Royal Fine Doctor I arrived at the spying unit in Brisbane. I remember just being completely shattered. Um, yesterday I could walk and I could run. I had the world at my feet. You know, a 19 you are, bigger, stronger, faster than Superman. And now I was being pushed into a spying unit, a, a body on a bed, completely helpless and, and trying to and trying to come with terms that I was now going to spend the rest of my life in a wheelchair. I had six months in the spine unit where you literally start all over again. I remember that one of the first things I learned to do in the spine unit once out of traction was to sit up in bed. Obviously when you're paralysed from here down, from here down becomes 75 kilos of dead, uncooperative weight. It took me days and days to learn how to sit up in bed. Then you've got to shift all this 
you know, 75 kilos of dead weight into a bath chair. There's the showering, the toileting, then it's back to my bed. You know, I then I had to learn to dress this lifeless body again. You know, I can't tell you what it's like to pull a pair of jeans onto a, a body that you have no sensation or, or no movement. But I think once dressed and in the chairs, then all the simple things you take so much for granted. You know, I wheeled over to a basin to try and comb the hair and I couldn't hold a comb. I went down to the dining room and couldn't hold a knife or a fork. Came back up in the room to try and clean my teeth and do you think I could get toothpaste on my toothbrush? So six months there and then my dream came true, all right? The spine in the doors open and I arrived home to the farm at Cropper Creek. But I can tell you it was never ever in the plan to arrive home in a wheelchair and getting home was just an absolute bloody nightmare. I got through the spine in record time and because of that I caught mum and dad by surprise, they were only part way through, you know, widening doors, putting, building ramps, um, building another accessible bathroom for me, putting in air conditioning, you know, doing all the things that I needed. I remember what I was picked up at lunchtime in Brisbane. When we got home, it was dark, so I had to instruct dad how to put the chair together. He pushed me across the lawn. We got to the, the front of the house where there were two steps, you know, the steps that I jumped up, jumped down, flowing up, flowing down. Most of my life now I was having to instruct mum and dad how to pull me up backwards in a wheelchair. If that wasn't demoralising enough, I then wheeled up into my old bedroom for the first time. And just, I remember being completely hit for six. You know, in front of me there was the life that I'd had. Um, a water ski and a surfboard in one corner, cricket bat over in the other corner. I remember pushing over to a rack where my footy boots were and, and grabbing them and putting them on my lap for the first time. And just a horrible realisation that I'd never play another game of rugby. You know, my dad was a wallaby and I, I would have loved to have had a crack at following his footsteps, but obviously that dream was now smashed. I couldn't do anything. I had no way of getting around the farm. I had no car, so basically I was housebound. But I think the biggest thing of all back then was learning to live my life from a wheelchair. You know, no longer Sam was that six foot tall, bulletproof young bloke who was fiercely independent. No longer was I a big brother, guardian angel to a younger brother and sister. No longer now was, was Sam a gladiator. Instead now I can used to people stopping and staring and looking at me and not knowing what to say. And Sam had to get used to asking for help. So in the course of, I don't know what it was, you know, a week, 10 days arriving home from the spawning unit, there I was in the absolute prime of my life with the horrible realisation now that my life was never going to be the way it was. My body from here down was never, ever going to do what it once did but was still going to come on for the ride with me and be absolutely no help to me. I realised that I'd, I had a massive, massive challenge ahead of me if I was going to try and make some sort of life for myself in the land. And I guess I'd, I'd hit rock bottom. But right at that moment, that grit that I'd learnt kicked in. There's no bloody way in the world I was going to let a spinal cord injury get in the road of what I always wanted and what I always dreamt of. So I rolled my sleeves up and set about to rebuild a, a badly broken life. I got all the inside stuff sorted, getting, you know, obviously learning to get dressed faster, pulling my boots on, top myself the thread of fork through my left hand, got quicker at getting my toothpaste under my toothbrush. So now it was time to venture outside. I then taught myself to get on and ride a full motorbike, which became my legs. Got my first car with hand controls, which got me back on the road and gave me some independence. I then converted all the farm machinery and, and devised a little hoist to get me up into the cabins of, of all the bits of gear that we had on the farm so now I could partake in all the cropping activities. I then learnt, I then climbed my very own Mount Kosciuszko when I learnt to fly an ultralight aircraft, which became a very powerful symbol for me. I travelled overseas for a couple of months I, uh, I had a crack at snow skiing one year down Thread Bay. Not always coming on the slope in the upright position, I might add, but had a wonderful 10 days down there. Guess I'd really had got my life back to some normality, somewhere it was before the, before the, uh, the accident. 
But there was just one hurdle left in front of me to jump, and that was finding a girl to share this life that I'd rebuilt. I uh, I had two or three very quick relationships over the years, but you know the girls would fall madly in love with Sam. But the following weekend, when they found out a bit more about his mate, quadriplegia and its restrictions, they ran. And I was accepting that. Obviously, made me realise that. You know, if you ever did find a girl, she was uh, she was going to have to be a pretty special one. I was now in my thirties, pretty well, and was now starting to think maybe the journey was going to be a solo one. If that's the way it was going to be, well, so be it. But I always knew I had lots of love and lots of affection that I could give a girl, and and hopefully that would far outweigh some of the limitations that I had. But I just had to find that girl. One of the great things about life is you never know what's around the corner. One wintry afternoon, the phone rang and I answered it and this bubbly voice introduced herself as Jenny Black. She said to me, Sam, you don't know me from Bar of Sight. I'm a rural reporter down here in Tamworth and I've been giving you a name by a number of people who've told me you've made a, a pretty remarkable life yourself up there at Cropper Creek. You happened to be in my region and she said I was just ringing on the off chance that I'd come and do a story about you. So anyway, I remember we teed up her day the following week and we just chatted and chatted and conversation flowed easily. She'd grown up on a sheep and cattle property at Scone in the Hunter Valley. Anyway, yak, yak, yak. I remember putting the phone down and thinking, gee, sounds all right. I wheeled out, mum was in the kitchen. And I said, have you ever heard of a girl called Jenny Black? And straight away, mum said, oh yeah, we've been listening to her for quite some time. She has a a program on just before the seven o'clock news each weekday morning and she said to me, why is that? I said, oh, that was her on the phone a minute ago and she's coming up here to do a story about me next week. And mum said, oh, no, it's an interesting program and she's often interviewing someone that we know. Ah, I thought to myself. So the following morning, I gave the local FM music station I've been listening to a flip. And I tuned my radio into ABC Radio in Tamworth and I started listening to this girl called Jenny. And I started, like all you guys would have done at some stage, painting a picture in my own mind of what I thought she looked like. For some reason, I imagined she was quite tall and she had a dark olive complexion. As every day went on, she got taller and taller and darker and darker. Finally, to the day she was to arrive, and I remember being pretty excited about it. And I thought, I'll jump my bike and I'll go down and wait for it at the front gate. So down I went, um, with this picture of this goddess in the back of my head. Got down there, not long after I got down there, I could see the swirl of dust in the distance. And up drove the white station wagon car. And as I got closer, I was eagerly peering through the windscreen to see there was an Albany reddish colour. So straight away the dark, old complexion disappeared. She drove up and she pulled up right beside me as I was sitting on my bike and she on my the window. And in a split second, I knew she wasn't going to be all that tall because the distance between the seat and the steering wheel was about that much. Sure enough, I followed her up to our house and out hopped a red-haired, freckly, sawn-off little runt. But there was a spark. To cut a long, long story short, and believe it or not, we, uh, we eventually fell madly, madly in love with each other and got to tell you the best thing that's ever happened to me. You know, just finding, finding that person to share, you know, the rest of your life with, to have a beer, you know, at sunset at the end of the day, to go on a holiday with, to share the good times and the bad. She really did come into my life and open every remaining door and gate that was in front of me. Like all you girls, she can normally talk under wet cement with a mouthful of marbles. But the morning that I uh, rang in and proposed to her live on her radio program, I had a stump just for a moment or two. What, a, uh, what an incredible morning that was. We, uh, we were then married and then I guess my dream really did come true. I arrived home to the farm at Cropper Creek as a farmer with my little mate tucked under my arm. And those first six... Those first six weeks in getting home was just absolute bliss. We, um, we were doing the cattle work together. Jen gave me a hand with the cropping when I needed it. Moved into a big old house, had me lived in for many years. Uh, ton of fun. Could life really get any better?
Well, it did. We were on the program Australian Story uh, quite a few years ago now. Some of you may have seen it. And I just remember the, the response we got. We, um, you know, probably from 80% of the people who had, had responded had suffered some life-changing hardship of their own and they'd seen our story and thought, well, if they can do it, we can too. So what Australian Story did was kickstart some public speaking. As you all know, there's only one thing worse than dying and that's public speaking. Initially, it was just locally for the first six or eight months till we found our feet, but literally for the last, you know, nearly 20 years now, Jen and I have been crisscrossing the country to sharing our story. It's an incredible life. One minute you can be in a capital city talking to the top end of town, next minute you're out in the middle of nowhere talking to a handful of people. We get to travel, we get to meet some, some amazing people. We give a lot, we give a bit, but we certainly give a lot back. Not long after we started speaking, we started getting a little bit of feedback and we noticed people were starting to mention a book, you know, and saying, have you guys ever thought of writing a story? Or, come on, Sam, you've got to, you've got to write your story because there is only so much of 40 odd years you can jam into a, a half hour presentation. Bugging me dead, I thought to myself, who's going to read my book? You know, I knew mum and dad'd be good for a copy and I can give one each to my brother and sister for Christmas, but Look, we respected their judgment. We, we sat down and wrote, and six months later, out came head over heels, and it's just been the most extraordinary journey. We sat down and wrote and thought, well, if we, um, if we sell a few copies and, and help one or two people, the whole effort's been well worthwhile. Well, it did come out, and I can tell you, Mum and Dad did get their copy. And it's just so gratifying for me knowing that your story, your whole of your story and some photos of what you do and how you do it can, can help. My life, again, one night was sent down another road when a school teacher friend of mine rang to, to invite me in to speak at a primary school. You know, I went, I tell you what, if you ever want to be a little bit daunted, go and sit in front of all primary school kids and try and keep them entertained. But look, I went in, I uh, told them a story, I spoke in their lingo. And at the end of it, she came up and said, well, I've never seen 33 kids sit there, riveted to your story. We went up to high school after that and got a similar result. So for the last 18 years now, generally I've been speaking to schools right around Australia. And I suppose I'm just trying to inject that grit that I think we're losing, you know, an appreciation of how lucky they are to be growing up in this country. But ultimately a realisation that, you know, if you put your mind to it, anything's possible. I don't know how we girls can talk and talk without drinking something. We, um, a question I'm often asked now is what's next? And yeah, what are guys gonna do next? We love our farm at Copper Creek and we'll keep, we'll keep farming as, 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 as long as we can. We'll keep showing the public speaking while ever, you know, we think we can, we're making a difference. We'll, we'll, we'll keep speaking. Um, but I have got another big goal, and that is to be the first quadriplegic in the world to fly a helicopter. And I suppose there are three main reasons for doing it. The first, obviously, is my love of flying, as the old flight did many, many years ago, for me to, to leave the earth and look back down on an empty wheelchair. I, uh, I really can't put that into words. Second thing I want to do it because there are a number of people who told me that I can't. But the third main reason is that as I was just saying, we get to speak to lots and lots of schools and and I suppose I remember back when we first started, um, I was thinking to myself, well, how can I better what I do? And I remember when I was speaking at school and as I was speaking, I was looking out the window and I, I saw their oval. And I thought to myself, well, you can't fly an aeroplane into an oval, but what a fantastic helicopter pad. So I wanted them to fly a helicopter and then fly it into their school land on their oval, hop out, call all the kids over, tell them your story and then hop back in and fly off. And I I just remember thinking that would be an image that would never leave me and hopefully as you fly away, Chief Sam can do what he's doing, I can do anything. So that's the goal we've got. We've been at it for many years now. I, I, I'm certainly in a position to, to know why World First don't happen every day of the week. They, uh, they certainly need some 
it takes some doing, but it will happen, and I'm sure you all hear about it when it does happen. The first school I'm flying to is a little Copper Creek school just down the road from, from where I, I grew up, and that'll be a little local launch, and then we'll see where it takes us from there. But So stay tuned, and it is the next book that we're writing because you don't need wings to fly. I'm a very, very lucky boat because I get to share every day, all day, with, with an extraordinary girl. She came into my life, she saw straight through, you know, quadriplegia in a wheelchair and she saw just Sam. And she has just taken it all in a stride. She's the one that allows me to farm. She's the one that allows me to speak. She's the one that, you know, packs, pushes, shoves and all of a sudden we end up in a stage somewhere in Australia. You know, I reckon it's one of life's greatest privileges to be sharing your life with your best mate. And, and what they don't tell you when you fall in love with your best mate is how it just gets better and better as the years roll by. She is my best mate. She's an absolute cracker of a girl. Would you please welcome her beside me? Hi. 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 Am I allowed to say a few words? Yeah, yeah. yeah you got about a minute. <laughs> oh, I've got a minute. Yeah, yeah. that'll be right. <laughs> Pretty hard for you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, I suppose I just, as I said, I just feel so lucky to be spending my life with Sam. And, you know, if someone had come to me when I was 18 and said, you're going to spend your life, um, you know, initially on a career that you're going to love, but you're then going to do something beyond your wildest dreams, and it's because you're going to share your life with someone who's a quadriplegic and who's in a wheelchair. I would have just said, I can't visualise that. I can't imagine that. That is beyond my comprehension. But you know, that's what happens. And I guess I sort of think about how important it is that your education and your childhood growing up to being an adult contributes so much to what you achieve in your life and and where it takes you and so you know it's really really important and I see that with Sam I see how he's taken a negative in his life and turned it into this amazing positive and achieved all these things and I'm sure you know a lot of that's due to family obviously and a lot of it's also due to education and the opportunities that in the skills that he learned at school, he mightn't have got the highest HSC school, high school certificate mark. But no, really, that didn't happen. <laughs> but he learned a lot of other skills that he's using today. Yeah. And I see that every day. And so education is so important. And, um, you know, and as a result, I'm getting to live this extraordinary life with this extraordinary man. Although I don't want you to think our life is perfect because it's not. Nobody's life is perfect. You know, and we have our moments. And, you know, I'm just a little bit nervous about he learned to fly a helicopter because of this because, you know, he just doesn't have great balance, you know. And I'll give you an example of the sort of things that happen, okay? Like we'd had a flood down through Cropper Creek and the creek sort of got steep bank, sandy bottom, and we just put um, electric tape down through the oh, creek. Oh, don't tell this story. <laughs> and it's just the two oh, of us no. on the four-wheel bike yeah. and we had no fencing gear with us. We didn't want to, you know, drive kilometres back to the house to get any. So I said to Sam, look, if you back the bike up to where the iron post has got to go back in and if I climb on the back, you know, the flat bit where the dogs sit and grab a big rock, I reckon I can hammer the iron post back in. So that's fine. He backs up and I climb up on the back and I've got a big rock in my hand and I'm hammering away and um, just put the iron post back in and I'm about to jump off the bike when the bike just took off and just went like flat out. I flattened my iron post and went flat out up the creek and I jumped off and like thinking, what on earth is happening? And watch this bike just go up the creek and then eventually tip over into a muddy water hole with Sam. I'm thinking Sam is under the bike, like, oh, my goodness, you know, I'm just petrified. And I'm like, Sam, are you all right? Are you okay? And he goes, you know, I'm all right, I'm all right. And he'd sort of been thrown off to the side. Drag him out of this muddy water hole. He's all oh, mud down one side. And I just said, like, what on earth just happened? <laughs> Very sheepish look on his face. Well, I was just twisting around to give you a little pinch on the backside, lost my balance and fell on the accelerator. And I'm like, oh. So you can see why I'm just a little nervous about him learning to fly a helicopter. Right, right, that's enough. <laughs> oh. All right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I she... could tell more stories. No, you're not going to tell any more stories. Isn't she gorgeous? <laughs>
Righto, trying to bring this journey to end. Um, look, I, I often used to wonder how my life might have ended up, had I got to that pub that Sunday afternoon, you know, what, nearly 34 years ago now. Obviously, I'll never, never know, but I don't know. Maybe I might have gone through life not realising that I did have an inner strength of some sort to not only pull myself through my own bit of bad luck, but now and, and go out and go out and help others through theirs. And so I don't know, kind of why I think that maybe the accident was really meant to happen. And look, I I had a I had a, the most amazing life up until the age of nineteen, but I got an absolute bloody ripper now, and I wouldn't trade places with any of you guys. So. Thanks, uh, thanks so much for having me. Enjoy the boarding school experience and, and um, hope to see you again one day.